I'm going to miss it. Um, it's been a wonderful journey. Acts is a powerful, powerful word of God, as are all of God's words. And <clears throat> at the end, we're going to see that there's triumph, even as we see Paul in his last appearance in the book of Acts. And near the end of his life, he has a couple of more years to live, but we will finish. And at the very end, we will see that this gospel is victorious. This good news of Jesus Christ is victorious and will be proclaimed onward without any hindrance. Nothing, nothing can stop the spread of God's word. And darkness will never, ever, ever overcome this light. We begin, as the journey picks up as they go to Rome, in, in verse um, 11 through 16, and you can look on the map here, we'll see them leaving. After three months, you remember they we, last we were preaching on this, they were in Malta, and we set sail in a ship that had wintered on the island of Malta, a ship of Alexandria, just like the ship that wrecked, it was a grain ship, with twin gods as a figurehead. Putting in at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days, and from there we made a circuit and arrived in Regium. And after one day, a south wind sprang up, and on the second day, we came to Puteoli. There we found brothers and were invited to stay with them for seven days. And so we came to Rome. And the brothers there, when they heard about us, came down to meet us as far as the uh, Forum of Appius and three taverns. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. And when we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with a soldier that guarded him. We came to Rome. They were on the island of Malta. There we go. I don't have my pointer. You can see it over here, right? Malta, M-A-L-T-A, right there. And that's where they had been. They had to stay the whole winter. Then they took a ship up to Syracuse, which is in Sicily, and on up to Regium. You can see that that's the toe of Italy. And then on up to Puteoli. And then they walked the rest of the way to Rome. Puteoli, the, the port there is very interesting. <clears throat> this um, port is where all the big Alexandrian grain ship, Alexandria from Egypt, you know, down over there, you can see Alexandria. They all came around, they came up to Rome because you got to feed an empire. And they got on the same ship and it had twin gods on it. And those um, twin gods are Castor and Pollux, the twins. That's Gemini, by the way. Gemini is a constellation. And um, I enjoy looking at stars a bit. And so if you look at the West, as, as soon as it's dark, you'll see Mercury, that big bright, you know, shining Mercury as it goes down. Mars is right behind it. And right now, Mars is right in Gemini. You'll see two stars by it with little things that hang down, a couple of little smaller stars. That's Gemini. That's the twins. And they were the twins from Zeus and uh, Leda, this is all made up, you know, all, all the Roman gods are all fiction, right? And so this is their, their, their traditions and their stories, but they're not real. But the stars, the Gemini constellation was considered good luck. Again, we don't believe in luck. You know that, uh, believers in Christ, we don't believe in astrology and all of that. So sailors would see the twins and they would they call that good luck. Whenever they could look on the western horizon and see the twins, they thought they were in good shape. Um, but that is what was on the front of that ship. And up it went, and they got into Puteoli. And then these words, which are the climax of the entire book of Acts, and so we came to Rome. And that's the climax because at the very beginning of Acts, it starts with Jesus, remember? He's ascending. And he is saying in Acts 1, he says, I am going to send you. You shall be my messengers, my 
people that share the gospel. You shall be my evangelist is actually the Greek word. You will receive power from the Holy Spirit. And when he has come upon you, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And when we finish Acts right now, <clears throat> and so we came to Rome. That's the end of the earth in this sense. Rome was the empire that had conquered the known Western world. And when the gospel arrived in Rome, it could be spread through those same ships with people that traveled. We already know that um, some disciples had gone to India. We know that the gospel then could go to the ends of the earth. So the beginning of Acts now comes to a close when they arrived at Rome and Jesus' command had been honored and fulfilled. Jesus' will will never fail, and it never failed here. Brothers from Rome came down the, the, the road. You may have heard of this road, the Appian Way. This is the big, the big interstate highway. Uh, is like I-95 from in Italy. I mean, it doesn't look like our interstate, but in those days, it was. It was paved, I mean, with, with stones, and it would look like an interstate. So they went up I-95 right into Rome, and there he was able to stay. He was greatly encouraged by these Christians. So don't you see, Jesus had already sent disciples, had sent the word to Rome, and there was already some house churches in Rome. And they came down to love and encourage Paul. Paul had written the church uh, about three years prior. So this meeting was precious, that he could see, wow, the word of God is alive in Rome. Thank you, Jesus. And so he went and was able to stay, as you can read there, in a private home. But one thing, he had a chain and he had a man, a guard, chained to him. Nowadays, they put ankle monitors on all the criminals and let them go. And they, of course, cut off the ankle monitors. Well, this is a wrist monitor. And, but this doesn't get cut off, and you're chained to a guard 24-7. And so pretty hard to escape that. But at least he was able to rent a house, and he probably rented a house, and stayed there uh, in, in Rome, and people would come and go and, and speak with him. So how do we share the gospel to the ends of the world? How does LifePoint Giles reach around the world? Well, most of you may know this, but with our budgets that we vote on once a year, we give over 10% of our money, of the money that we collect here, we tithe over 10% of that that goes through the cooperative program of uh, Baptist that Southern Baptist that we have 35 almost 4,000 missionaries around the world in 145 different countries. So people pooling their money funds all of that, and the gospel literally is preached around the world. But that's not all. There are people here. Many of you, some of you, have been on mission trips. Some of you are going on mission trips uh, to other countries this year. I've been on <clears throat> numerous mission trips over the past 30, 40 years. We as a church, as we grow, that may be something the Lord will lead us to where we will have a mission team going to another country. But right away, we are funding thousands of missionaries around the world. And we have personally, people in this room, have been to other countries sharing the gospel. And that is another way that we have and continue to share the gospel around the world. But this commission <clears throat> is a little scary. You remember, you will receive, will receive power from the Holy Spirit. 
and then you will be my witnesses. And uh, that in Greek, you will is a plural imperative, future imperative, and a future uh, a second person plural in Southern is y'all. Y'all, meaning every one of us, you all will. Now, <clears throat> that will is important. It's not shall or might or may. You will be my witnesses. You will preach the word. You will speak on my behalf. It is not an option. And that's scary. If you really look at that, that is scary. Because it's saying, oh, I, I, I like just putting money in the plate and let, let us send that money to those missionaries. That's easy. I love doing that. Okay. Well, we do that. And yes, in a way it is easy, but it still accomplishes God's work. So a lot of folks, well, I give money to missionaries. I don't need to do this. I give money to the pastor and the church and the church leadership. They spread the word. It's really up to deacons and Sunday school teachers and elders and all these people. They're the ones that need to spread to preach the word. They need to do it. No, you're mistaken. The word says, you will, you all, plural, every one of you, will be my messengers. You'll be my witness. It's not a suggestion. It is a command. And when we don't follow that, we are not being obedient, are we? And I know that sounds hard. And we say, well, I don't have the education. I don't have all the Bible knowledge. I haven't been to enough Bible studies. Well, that's not what Jesus says. He doesn't say, well, when you finish reading the Bible 10 times, then you be my witness. Did he say that? Did he say after you read the Bible 10 times? No. He says, you will be my witnesses. The Holy Spirit, he already promised that. I will give you the Spirit. The Spirit will give you the words. His word is truth, and that word will come to you. We shall be witnesses. Through the power of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit he has given us, we are all witnesses to the end of the earth. Scary as that is, we are. So what did Paul do while he was in jail? Well, in house arrest is, is really more accurate. Uh, we're going to look at <clears throat> what went on in that house. After three days, in verse 17, um, after three days, he called together the local leaders of the Jews. So you see he's going to the Jews first. They had gathered. And he said, brothers, though I had done nothing against our people, meaning the Jewish people, or the customs of our father, Yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. When they examined me, they wished to see me at liberty because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had, not, they had no charge to bring against me, against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I've asked you to see you and speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain, showing the chain on his wrist. And they said to him, we have received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you. But we desire to hear from you what your views are for the, with regard to this sect. We know that everywhere it is spoken against. When they appointed a day, they came to the lodge in greater numbers from morning till evening. Now that's some preaching. He expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God, trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And that's the entire, it means the entire scripture that they had the old, uh, um, uh, in the old, the old Testament, the entire Old Testament. And disagreeing, some were convinced Others disbelieved. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right 
in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, this is from Isaiah 6, go to this people and say, you will indeed hear, but not, never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. So here we go again. This is the same storyline all through Acts, right? Every new city Paul comes to, he goes to the synagogue. He preaches in the synagogue. And there are some converts. But then they throw him out or they beat him or they try to kill him or they try to stone him. And they reject the gospel. And he is preaching the hope of Israel. This is the Messiah that all of Scripture points to. And that's what he does. He starts with Moses through all the prophets and the writings and says, look, all these things point to Jesus. And here he is. Listen, some of them did, but most of them didn't. He wore chains for the hope of Israel. The Jews. They were not impressed. This sect they call, they call them the Nazarenes because Jesus was from Nazareth or the way. It was called the way in Rome. Uh, this is the word that was used for this Christian group, which was first thought of as a splinter group of Jews. And essentially, most of the church was Jewish at the very beginning. So they set up a second meeting and they spent all day talking, and they disagreed with each other, huffed out of there, and departed. Now, these words from Isaiah still are meaningful today. <clears throat> you hear, but you don't understand. You see, but you don't receive, perceive. Your heart is dull. Your ears barely hear. Your eyes are closed. But yet if they would turn, he would heal them. And they're going to the gospel will now go to the Gentiles. Well, we see people with hard hearts and eyes and ears that don't see and hear right now, don't we? We've been praying for a couple of men, you know, whose hearts are closed just like this. I remember a power couple. That's what they'd be called now, a power couple. But this was back probably 25 years ago or more. That word wasn't invented then. But this was a power couple that came to Blacksburg, and I became their caregiver for, as a physician. They came from Michigan, from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. The, the male in the, in the couple came as a department head to Virginia Tech, the head of a big department. Uh, his... Spouse came as a distinguished professor in the same department. And so they were a big time power couple. Top jobs, top incomes, no children, just the two of them. And we, I got to be pretty good friends with them. I, I shared Christ with them. And they were very intellectual, very smart. And always had excuses. Well, you know, I believe in evolution. I believe in blah, 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 blah. And I don't have any room in my, my intellectual. I'm so smart. I got everything figured out. I don't need this Jesus. And despite sharing the word with them, that never changed anything. Their hearts were hard. They were so intelligent. They were such a big power couple and so looked up to in all the community that they didn't need God. And when the husband died, he died as a lost man. His wife, then alone, they, again, they had no children. All they had was their big brains, 
She went back to Michigan to live with some distant family members that were in her in her in her life. And I don't know what happened to her. That she moved to Michigan. I pray that somehow that hard heart was broken and that she somehow came to the Lord. But don't you see, we all have ears, we all have eyes, we all have hearts, but sometimes we don't listen. Now, my wife will testify a thousand hours about the times I have not listened to her. I hear, you know, I mean, this is what Jesus teaches. I mean, you know, you think the gospel is kind of hard to understand. It's not hard at all, is it? If you have teenagers, you tell them to do something, they hear it, but do they actually do it? And I see some heads shaking. No, 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 no. They hear, but they don't listen. They see, but they don't perceive. The heart is dull. And we, in our study of the Psalms last year, a dull heart is a heart that's hardened. It's a heart of stone. And that's why God teaches us in Ezekiel that he's going to give us a new heart, a heart of flesh, a heart transplant. We all need heart transplants. And that occurs. Now, we laugh at teenagers. You laugh at me because I don't listen to my wife sometimes. Not too often, just, no, I'm teasing probably a lot. But all of us had these characters, characteristics before we came to Christ, didn't we? We all had a hard heart. We all thought, oh, I know everything. And I still, according to my wife, claim I know everything. I've got all the answers. I don't really need God. Then finally, something breaks our heart, doesn't it? Our heart, we are convicted. And that's the Holy Spirit. We are convicted. Our heart is broken. And we say, oh, Jesus, forgive me. I am such a sinner. I've been so selfish. Come into my heart. I want you to be my Savior. And our heart opens. Our eyes now see. We see the word. We hear the word proclaimed. It comes into us and we take it in. But these very same words before we became Christians would just fly over us. But yet, even after we become Christians, and this gets personal to you and to me, there are periods in our lives when we turn back, don't, aren't there? Where we're not walking the path Jesus wants us to walk. We have gone off on a side direction. And all of a sudden, our ears aren't hearing. Our eyes aren't seeing. And our hearts get cold. Get dull is the word that's used in Hebrew. Get cold. And hallelujah, the Holy Spirit convicts us. We repent of our sin, our transgressions. And what does he say? I will heal you. You turn back to me, I'll heal you. He does through the blood of Christ. We are forgiven. Our lives are changed, are renewed. And our faith and our strength in the Lord gets stronger and stronger as we return to him, even in our wandering. So it's not just people who don't know the Lord. It's not just us before our salvation, but it's us right now where we wander. And so I pray that we will wake up if we are getting Lazy in our prayer life, lazy in our Bible study, lazy in our worshiping together corporately, that the Spirit will convict us, that, hey, wake up. Open your eyes to see my word. Open your ears to hear my word proclaimed. Open your heart to me because that is what he calls us to do. So through this power, the Lord of the Lord Jesus, through his spirit, we are all to be witnesses, all of us, to the end of the earth. We turn to him in repentance, and he will heal us and make our ears hear, our eyes see, and our hearts to take in his word. 
But then that's not the end. The final verses here are some amazing verses. 30 and 31. He lived there two years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Wow. These verses are an amazing close to the church, early church that we see in Acts. Paul lived there a couple of years. He may have been released and, and been free for a little bit, but was rearrested and brought back to Rome. But for a couple of more years, he was able to preach, and he did so. He preached about what? He preached about the kingdom of God the kingdom of God, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what does that mean? The kingdom of God has come. All of Scripture points to that. And the center of God's kingdom, the central foundation, is Jesus Christ. That's what he's preaching. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, the center of the kingdom of God, whose kingdom came to earth through baby Jesus, whose kingdom is now here, whose kingdom is supported by the Holy Spirit from Jesus, whose kingdom is centered in the cross, in the death and resurrection that we just celebrated a couple of weeks ago of our Lord and Savior. That is the center of the kingdom, and that is what Paul is preaching, and that is what Jesus commands you to proclaim. His kingdom, centered in Jesus, in this earth right now. And what happens? He preached with all boldness and without any hindrance. He boldly proclaimed. Nothing was stopping him. And this last word, hindrance, the last word in this whole book, ties it together. And there was a great... <clears throat> As I was preparing and, and, and praying over this and studying, the, God just works in miraculous ways. I remember my dad, when he was in seminary a thousand years ago, I'm not quite that old, but he was in seminary after the World War II. He, he was, and at any rate, he came back and finished his study in there. And one of his favorite professors was a gentleman by the name of Frank Stagg. I remember him, but maybe I was a teenager. I remember that name. Well, as I was preparing and looking at uh, some of things, one of the most famous words about this passage of Scripture came from F. Stagg, Frank Stagg, written in a book that he called The Gospel Unhindered. Uh, it was a commentary on Acts, written in 1955. My dad was in seminary, got out in 52, this is, and these are his words as he wrote Frank Stagg, this guy that I remember my dad talking about and what a wonderful professor he was. And it is about this hindrance. Nothing can stop the gospel. This final word in Acts shows that the unbound, triumphant gospel overcomes every barrier of superstition and every barrier of human prejudice. And think about that. Think about that. This gospel now is triumphant. It's centered in the cross of Jesus, the center of the kingdom of God. And nothing, and I love these words, nothing can stop this gospel. Nothing, not human superstition, believing in astrology, believing in rocks, believing in false teachings, and human prejudice. You hear those words? Human prejudice. Can't overcome this. Because we face, as Christians, a lot of anti-Christian, all boldness, and as 
proclaim unhindered. Nothing can stop the gospel. What a gift. As I close, a lot of people get very discouraged with our situation in the Western world, particularly in our country, as we see things falling apart, as we see all sorts of things going on. I'm not going to get into it. But we think, oh, goodness, our world's coming to an end. Well, if Jesus comes today, hallelujah, come, Jesus, come. Maranatha, that's that word, you know, the end of Revelation. Come, Jesus, come quickly. Hallelujah, come right now. I mean, we're ready. We don't know when he's going to come, but we are to be faithful and we are to be bold and we are not to have any hindrance and we are to proclaim this gospel because that is his command at the beginning. And yet we see everyone in Acts die. And so we think, oh, that's terrible. Stephen, the first guy, killed. Peter, killed. And now Paul, yeah, he's got two more years to live, but he's going to be killed. And most people look, that's crazy. Everybody that proclaims the gospel dies. Well, in a way, we're all going to die. Yes, some with their head cut off proclaiming in Rome. And if you go to Somalia right now and proclaim the gospel, you will die. But the gospel is triumphant. God uses our lives however long they are. And then he raises up other people. And he raises up other people. And we are just part of that. And we're all going to die. But we proclaim the gospel with boldness every day of our life. However long that is. And that is what... I see happening here. I see people inviting family, friends, even strangers to our church. I see people studying God's word, growing in their faith. I see people part of a fellowship that uh, is just so powerful. That's the Lord working. And that is what he calls us to do. Through the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't do this on our own. You already said at the beginning, I'm going to give you power through the Holy Spirit that will enable you to proclaim and be my evangelist to the ends of the earth. Nothing stopping you because this gospel is victorious. This good news, the kingdom of God is triumphant and death has nothing to do with it. It will overcome all all and it is victorious so be bold nothing can stop you proclaiming this victorious gospel of our lord jesus christ pray with me